Welcome everyone and thank you for joining the GRSS webinar hosted by the Earth Science Informatics Technical Committee. Uh, my name is Manuel Maske and I'm from NASA and I also co-chair the Earth Science Informatics Technical Committee. And I would like to introduce Dr. Dan Morris, who is a principal scientist with Microsoft's uh, AI for Earth program. Uh, this is the program uh, with a goal of uh, accelerating innovations in machine learning and environmental sustainability, particularly through the planetary computer platform, which is what Dan is going to talk about today. A little bit about Dan. Dan's past work ranges from developing signal processing and machine learning techniques for cardiovascular health monitoring to generating musical accompaniment for vocal melodies. He studied neuroscience at Brown and his PhD work at Stanford focused on haptics and uh, physical simulation for virtual surgery. First, we'll let uh, Dan uh, finish his talk and then open the floor for discussion and questions. And just to note that uh, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, Dan, the floor is yours. Hey, thanks. Uh, Mr. Inverby can see and hear me unless somebody waves their hands and bugs me otherwise. Um, and the, I am gonna tell you about the Planetary Computer, but before I get started, just, I love being interrupted. So please, I can't quite see the chat the way my windows are laid out, but please, please feel free to shout out and interrupt me if you have questions. My goal is always to not finish my slides. Uh, so I'm Dan from the AI for Earth program at Microsoft. Uh, I'm gonna tell you today about what the AI for Earth program is and what the Planetary Computer is that we're working on. I always start all my talks with gratuitous pictures of animals, especially morning talks, because pretty pictures of animals put everybody in a good mood. I also sometimes have the luxury of actually talking about pictures of animals, but even when I'm not, like today, I start my slides with pictures of animals. Everyone should do the same. All right, so I said I work for the AF Earth program at Microsoft. Before I get to the Planetary Computer, I'm gonna spend just a couple slides telling you what the AF Earth program is. I'm hoping you, I mean, a bunch of you have heard of AF Earth. I know it has something to do with AI and something to do with Earth, but I wanna put a, a finer point on what we do. Uh, so our job is to put the put Azure to work for environmental sustainability. And we basically do that in three ways. Uh, we're a grants program. We build some machine learning tools. And then last but not least, most of what I'm going to talk about today is we put geospatial data to work through the planetary computer. So I'm going to spend just a few slides on the grants and machine learning stuff and then devote most of our time today to the planetary computer. Uh, so I mentioned we are a grants program. We give both money and Azure resources to organizations all over the world working at the intersection of uh, AI and environmental sustainability. We have a very broad definition of what AI is. So I'd say really we support folks working at the intersection of cloud computing uh, and environmental sustainability. Um, I wish I had time today to tell you the stories of all our 700 plus grantees all over the world but I don't because I want to get to the planetary computer. So I will encourage you to go visit this page, AKA MS AF for E grantees. We still don't tell the stories of all 700 plus of our grantees, but we tell a lot of our grantees stories. So head over here if you want to learn more about what our grantees are up to. Okay, right, so that's all I want to say about our grants program. Go check out AKA MS AF for e grants if you want to learn more about our grants program or apply for grants. The next thing I said we do, still not mostly what I'm going to talk about today, is we do, there is some AI in AI for Earth. We build some machine learning tools. And all of these tools kind of fall into a similar category, which is anytime you know, we're sitting here on this call right now and all over the world, environmental scientists working on important problems are doing some really boring stuff to make progress toward solutions to those problems. Uh, in particular, there's a lot of data annotation that goes into all types of environmental science work, uh, and particularly in the geospatial, geospatial analysis area and in the wildlife conservation space, uh, we are working on a bunch of machine learning tools that uh, try to help conservation scientists spend less time clicking stuff and more time doing conservation. So even though the data types are very different in all of these areas, that's the gist of what we do in all those spaces. If this were a machine learning talk, I would do a real deep dive on a bunch of these. But again, we're talking about the planetary computer today, and I want to get there. So I'm just going to give you, I'm going to flash a couple of slides by you, kind of give you some resources to play with on your own. One of the areas we work in is accelerating the processing of wildlife images from motion triggered camera traps. Basically, by the way, basically everything I'm going to talk about today is open source. So you'll see a bunch of GitHub links. There's one. For all the things I'm going to show you in this section of the talk, 
Let me give you one of these one slide overviews. We help people get through camera trap images faster. And then you can go tinker with the demo. If you get bored of my talk, you can head over to AKMS camera trap demo uh, and tinker with our demo to see how we accelerate the processing of camera trap images. Similarly, near and dear to many of the hearts of people on this call, I expect, uh, Microsoft has done a bunch of work on land cover mapping. Um, and if you get bored of my demo and you're not interested in camera trip images, you can also head over to AKMS land cover demo to tinker with some of the work we've done in land cover mapping. Still the same theme. See if we can not automate, but accelerate some of the tedious tasks that are really important to environmental sustainability. And then rinse and repeat for aerial wildlife detection and other area images that are even more boring to look at than camera trap images when you have to look at 10 million of them at a time. Uh, and similarly, if you tried the other two demos and you're still bored of my talk, you can head over to AKMS Aerial Wildlife Demo and try out this one too. So that gives you a feel for some of the kind of machine learning stuff that we do, that in a more machine learning -y talk, I would be talking lots and lots about. I love talking about pictures of animals, but that's not what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna talk about today is the planetary computer, but before, just before I tell you what a planetary computer is, I'm going to put this in a little bit of context. So AI for Earth sits in uh, Microsoft's environmental sustainability program. Uh, and the job of our broader family, the environmental sustainability program at Microsoft, is to fulfill the ambitious sustainability commitments that Microsoft set out last year. So some of you may have caught that Microsoft committed to becoming a carbon negative company, to replenish more water than we use, and to be, uh, achieve zero waste by 2030. And then in April of last year, we rather quietly snuck in one more very important commitment. Now, I know this one flew under the radar a little this year because some of you may remember that in April of 2020, the world had other things on its mind. But we did make a commitment we're really proud of uh, to protecting ecosystems. And this was really about two things. This was about uh, minimizing, uh, offsetting our own impact, uh, Microsoft's impact to ecosystems by committing to protect more land than we use. And sometime we can talk about how we figured out how much land we use, because that's another story for another time. Uh, we also committed to building a planetary computer to put our tools to work for ecosystem protection in the hands of the conservation community. Now, finally, <clears throat> finally, we're gonna talk about the planetary computer. Uh, I'm gonna pause really briefly there. I just zoomed through in less than eight minutes, everything that has to do with the AF Earth program that doesn't have anything to do with the planetary computer. Any questions? And again, I'm not looking at the chat, so feel free to shout out. Okay, let's talk planetary computer then. Before I tell you exactly what the planetary computer is, let me tell you why we're building a planetary computer. So as many folks on this call know, environmental sustainability is critically dependent on very large geospatial data sets, and particularly that's remote sensing data and weather and climate data. And it turns out that working with geospatial data, whether it's big or tiny, is a big pain, unless you have a PhD in remote sensing. And it turns out that working with very large data, whether it's geospatial or not, is a big pain, unless you have lots of experience in the dark arts of distributed computing. And unfortunately, our audience, the audience we support with our grants program, the people at the front lines of conservation usually have neither of the above. Uh, and that's why our planetary computer platform is putting key environmental data sets alongside processing tools and a managed compute environment to lower the access barrier that prevents sustainability practitioners from working with large geospatial data. Uh, and it's also equally importantly why we're uh, why our planetary computer uh, partners are building applications that put the platform to work for environmental decision making. Finally, I'm going to tell you now what. A planetary computer is. So the planetary computer consists of four key components. And oh, I haven't put a link yet, but you can all, if you're all feeling like you want to browse while I'm talking, planetarycomputer.microsoft.com. Easy to remember. So, um, planetary computer uh, consists of four key components that I'm going to tell you about in a little bit more detail. Don't worry, you don't have to get it all from this slide. Uh, a foundation of geospatial data that is uh, around 20 petabytes of primarily remote sensing data. Though I'll talk about some other data types that we are either hosting already or are growing. Uh, a set of querying and processing APIs to make it easier to find the data that you want in that very large catalog. A managed compute environment that we call the Planetary Computer Hub, particularly for data science type workflows. And then last but not least, a series of applications developed by partners that put those things to work for sustainability. 
So first, let's talk a little bit about our data catalog. I want to highlight this slide is not meant to be exhaustive. You can check out planetarycomputer.microsoft.com slash catalog for a longer list of data we have available right now. I host this, I put this slide here to give you a feel for the flavor of data that we are hosting on the Planetary Computer Catalog. Um, folks on this call will be happy to hear that the vast majority of data as measured by bits is in fact remote sensing data, uh, including the full Sentinel-2 catalog, for example, a complete uh, Landsat 8 archive, um, and a variety of other remote sensing data sets, uh, and a growing catalog of weather and climate data. And then a couple of other data types that, while not nearly as large as climate projections from remote sensing data, are equally important to the kinds of workloads that we want to support. So a good amount of land cover data that's both useful unto itself and useful as training data for a lot of the kind of problems that we want to support, and a growing catalog of biodiversity data that, of course, is important for uh, analyzing uh, species population distributions alongside climate data and remote sensing data, any other kinds of large data sets that we host. Uh, aside from telling you just the specific kinds of data sets that we host, I also want to talk a little bit about what it means for us to bring one of these data sets to Azure. So we're working really hard uh, to bring all of this data to a single Azure region, a single data center, uh, to really facilitate analyses that leverage more than one of these data sets. For example, a lot of you on this call have probably worked with for example, Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2 data together. We want to make that as easy as possible. And part of that is making sure that we get all of this into a single Azure region so that it's computationally efficient without incurring lots of networking time or networking costs to work with uh, Landsat and Sentinel data together, for example. So we bring the vast majority of this data to a single Azure region. It happens to be the West Europe Azure region, but that's less important than the fact that we're trying to get it all into a single Azure region. We're also working really hard to get all of this data into a consistent set of file formats. Uh, so the vast majority of the remote sensing data that we host, whether it began life that way or not, will be hosted, is hosted as COGS. Uh, so for example, we've converted the whole Sentinel-2 archive to COGS. And whenever possible, the all of the weather and climate data that we're bringing on will be converted to ZAR. For, so both cloud-friendly formats for optimized analysis. There will always be exceptions. There's always reasons why we have to break the rules, but we do want to get things as consistent as possible so that when you want to work with Landsat and Sentinel data and GOES data uh, in the same analysis, you don't have to work with different tools for every data set you want to work with. We want to make as consistent an experience as possible across all of the different data sets that we're supporting. Um, and then similarly, whenever possible, we're also trying to make this data as close to what the community considers analysis ready as possible. So for example, the Sentinel-2 data that we host uh, has been processed uh, with CentiCore to, uh, to surface reflectance. That's at eight. We didn't have to do that. It begins like that way for us uh, since we're pulling the level two collection two archive. Um, but when, when we need to do some work to get it there, we're trying to bring all of this data again, consistent file format, single Azure region, and uh, four particular data sets to uh, a state that the community considers analysis ready. Uh, before I move on from data to APIs, I'll pause for questions about data. So, uh, Dan, there are a few questions in the chat. Sure, uh, by the way. Since you, since you prefer interruption, I'll fire it away. I do. Uh, <laughs> I think one question was related to GitHub links. I think that's already been answered. Um, the next question is, how frequent is the data catalog updated? Also, what is the current time lag in terms of days of remote sensing data, example, for Landsat? Uh, so, in general, we, so let me start with, and let me answer for Sentinel-2 first, once it's a little more complicated. Um, so for our Sentinel-2, actually all the Sentinel products that I list here, um, they are updated in sort of, I'll call it near real time. Uh, you know, we don't stress too much, you know, for a satellite that has a, re a revisit time of days, it's sort of like how much do we want to get hung up on minutes versus a couple of hours. So I think for the Sentinel data sets that we host, we consider for something that has a revisit time of days, we would consider kind of a couple of hours to be uh, a new real time standard that we want to hold ourselves to. Um, and that's where we'll be at for um, somewhere between hours and sub day is a good ballpark for data sets like uh, the Sentinel data sets that we're hosting. Um, 
some data sets that we host, like the NOAA operational forecast data, not mentioned on this slide, uh, like the GFS data that's mentioned on this slide, their real timeness is critical. So we work pretty closely with NOAA on those. So those are updated closer to the order of minutes. That's not the norm amongst the type of data that we host, but for forecast data that's used for, for operational forecasting, uh, those would be on the order of minutes. Landsat in particular is a little more complicated because the vast majority of the data that we we are hosting the Landsat 8 Collection 2 Level 2 data. Uh, we're not processing that ourselves since USGS is producing a Level 2 archive, but that's not produced instantaneously after the Level 1 data is available. So we have near real-time Level 1 data, but we only keep a short window of that, 30 days, basically so that data is there until the Level 2 data becomes available. Um, so, And it's anywhere between days and a couple of weeks before the Level 2 data is available for a recently collected scene. So I think the follow-up for that question is, so Sentinel data for yesterday would be available today? That's the question on the chat. You should test us on that, but that would be the goal, yes. Thank you. Am I audible, Dan? Yeah. Uh, Dan, more am I audible? You are, yep. Uh, I just had a question that uh, uh, regarding this planetary computer data, uh, there is, uh, it's written here, Sentinel 1, 2, and 3 data is available. So I just want to know that, um, is it really freely available and it, is it latest data that I can get from this website or catalog? I'm going to, um, I'm going to dive in on two different words there, available and free. And, and the, the answer is going to be yes and yes with a couple of small caveats. Uh, so we kind of have two levels of available right now. There is data that we have. I'm going to get into this in a little more detail in a second, but we have data that we have physically brought to Azure, but that is not yet queryable through our planetary computer API. You know, when so Sentinel One is in this category right now, for example. We have Sentinel One data on Azure, it's well documented and it's available. The API I'm going to talk about in a second, we haven't pulled that metadata into our database yet. However, we encourage people and support people working with it already. But for example, to do a spatio-temporal query on Sentinel One data right now, you'll have to do something a little different than using our API, which you can use for Sentinel Two data, for example. We will all of the data that we are bringing to Azure eventually will be available through our API. So you can use exactly the same tools to do spatial temporal queries. Not every data set yet is in that state. Um, so Sentinel One, for example, on Azure, not yet available through our APIs, but will be soon. Um, and the spirit of available and free is that yes, all of this data is freely available to work with in the Azure region where it's hosted. So there's, I won't get too far into the weeds here, but the spirit of what we wanna convey is that uh, this data is meant to be worked with freely for anybody who wants to work with it on the cloud. Part of what we do as the Azure Earth program is give out Azure credits for people. We are a grants program, I mentioned before, we give out Azure credits for people to work with this data on the cloud. So I would think of it as, I, I'll say I'm, I'm, I'm hedging a little bit because we do support some amounts of egress for certain scenarios, but the spirit of what we really want to encourage is for large scale workloads. We want to help you do that. Not, we will not want to not only help you do that work in the West Europe Azure region where all of this data is hosted, but in a lot of cases through our grants program, we'll even give you Azure credits to do it, but it's free in that sense. And yes, it's freely available to work with, um, with the caveat that in most scenarios, it's freely available to work with in the Azure region where it's hosted. So then there are a few more questions in the chat. Should we take that or uh, I don't know how long your presentation is, so. <laughs> you know, I'll leave it up to you because I'd always rather just talk and answer questions than okay. uh, see the best. I've seen my whole talk. I don't know. <laughs> I need to see it again. <laughs> so if people have more questions, I'll leave it to you as moderator to decide where you want to cut things off. Um, okay. And I, yeah. I think there's one more important question here. Sure, fire away. Are there plans to include other commercial data providers such as Planet, Maxar? and or bring your own data? Good question. Actually, really quick, I'm going to answer the very short question that came after that, which is GHG. That's the Noble okay. Glider, no, NOAA Global Hydro Estimator product. Okay. Um, commercial data, in general, with a couple of caveats, in general, commercial data is outside the scope of what we do. Uh, we work closely with other groups at Microsoft that uh, help make commercial data available, particularly through Azure Maps on Azure and we're going to continue to have a hopefully a clearer and clearer integration story with Azure Maps over time. But in general, our scope is mostly uh, publicly available data. Um, the bring your own data uh, is really important to us. And I'll say right now, this is uh, one of the shortcomings in the planetary computer tools that we have right now. So 
It's easy for me to dodge the question by saying, you know, when you're working in our compute environment, you are working on Azure. You have access to everything you, you know, you're, you're working in a generic Azure environment. I think that's a good thing. And I can say, bring your own cloud files and do it, put them in blob storage and do whatever you want. That's true, but that's not necessarily the experience we want to be providing for our users. We really do want you to be able to particularly query your own data through the same tools that you use to query our data. So you'll see, I'll demo all this in a second. You'll see here's the, uh, here's the code you would use to find Sentinel-2 scenes from Peru in 2018. We want you to be able to use more or less, have the same experience querying your own data in the same way. We don't have that yet, but that's something that's really important to us and that we're hoping to get better and better at and have a clear story there uh, by the about the end of this year. But between now and then we will, have hopefully lots of good examples of for different types of data, how you can best index your own data, a little bit more DIY, but we know how important that is. We know that the vast majority of interesting problems people are gonna do with our data will almost always involve some bring your own data also, and we will hopefully get better and better at supporting that over time. I promise one more question. I think this is an important sure. one uh, related to integrity, data integrity, I think. Um, so the question starts with how are your archives different from NASA, ESA, et cetera? So the, I, I think the question uh, is when you're converting into, for example, COGS or ZAR, um, are you modifying the data? And if so, uh, how are you getting validation? So overall, we are not, um, we're not taking a strong stance that says we have to host precisely the original data, um, but we, I would say we are not making any opinionated, with, with the exception of Sentinel-2 that I'll come back to in a second, we're not making any opinionated transformations on the data. So we're not doing any lossy compression in general. We're not doing any uh, potentially lossy reprojection of data. We're storing, our, in all cases currently, we are storing more or less the original tiling in the original projection, for example. Um, so for for Landsat's, I'm gonna have to, unfortunately the answer is gonna vary a little bit by data set, but I, hopefully this will I'll answer for a couple different data sets and this will give you the spirit of how we're thinking about this. Landsat 8, we're pulling the collection two level two data, actually all of Landsat, we're pulling the collection two level two data, which means, it, which is already in COG, already atmospherically corrected and we are literally not modifying the bits at all. Uh, Sentinel-1 is another good example of we are converting the GRD data from in a non-lossy, unopinionated way uh, to COG, um, but that's not the original bits. So, we, you know, some transformation has happened there. Um, and I, we understand there's like a minor risk associated with somebody using anything other than the authoritative bits, but for that kind of unopinionated transformation, we hope that's a risk that folks are willing to take. Sentinel-2 is probably our most opinionated transformation because we have run Centicore to convert to bottom of atmosphere and convert to COG. Um, we're still keeping the original scene structure. Centicore is you know, a well understood uh, publicly available tool, but that is an opinionated transformation that you know we understand there's that makes them non-authoritative bits, um, but well described and familiar bits. I would say un uncreative in a good way is kind of what we're going for for all of the data sets that we're hosting. Let's proceed in the interest of time. <laughs> Do you sure. I'll, I'll answer one really quick one that I saw in the chat too, which is the okay. Sentinel One SLC versus GRD. We're hosting the full GRD archive. Uh, and a 90-day window of the S of the unmodified SLC data. So for real-time e-applications, the SLC data will be available in its original safe format. The GRD data is the one we're taking that very slightly opinionated conversion to COG and hosting the complete archive. Okay, now we've talked about data. Let's talk about, oh, so if we do all the things I just told you about, uh, we hopefully get things to a single Azure region. We get things into pretty consistent file formats in a pretty analysis ready state, um, which I say this slide kind of facetiously, but obviously that was a lot of work that we're proud of. Uh, but if we do all that, it gets us to a super slick pile of files, which is great, but it's not necessarily uh, enough because most of our users don't want lists of files in Azure blob storage. They want analysis ready pixels for the regions and times they care about. Uh, which brings us to our planetary computer APIs, or really you now kind of API, but I'll talk about some forthcoming tools also. Uh, so of course, the single most important 
API we need to support is just our canonical spatiotemporal querying API that 100% of people who do some analysis like this, everybody on this call every day does something like, find me all the Landsat images from Wyoming in 2012. And we need to make that uh, smooth and easy in our planetary computer environment, consistent across all of our API, all of our data sets. And as I mentioned, ideally consistent across user provided data sets also. We're not there yet, but we're getting close to that for all of the data sets that we host. So we have uh, heavily leveraged the work that uh, the stack community has led, I bet, Good amount of you are familiar with Stack, the uh, Special Temporal Asset Catalog Standard. Um, we are hosting a Stack compliant API, which you can go check out and play with, and I'll demo in a second, time permitting, um, that currently indexes uh, many, but not all yet, of the data sets we host. So we're getting very close to, and the difference between what is and isn't indexed in our Stack API, I think, is very clear on our data catalog page. I won't give you an exhaustive list of the data sets we've brought into our Stack API and the ones we have it, but I think it's very clear on our data catalog page. Um, but so, for example, our single Stack API allows you to query across our Landsat, Sentinel, NAEP, and Aster data. Um, uh, and that is probably the single most important API we will have for the foreseeable future, and we want to continue to improve that. Uh, we also recognize that, well, that's the first thing that most people do when working with large data sets like this. The second thing that people do with data sets like this typically comes from a fairly canonical set of operations that would include resampling or mosaic creation. And while we don't have canonical APIs for this yet, I mentioned on this slide, because this is something we're also working toward in the next kind of six months time frame, is to have a very consistent uh, set of tools maybe not exactly APIs, but probably client-side tools, built, open source client-side tools built to run nicely in our planetary computer hub that do these canonical raster operations uh, like resampling and, uh, and blending. Um, I will not get into too much more detail here since I'm gonna demo this in a second. Uh, and also many of you are probably already familiar with Stack and kind of have a, a feel for um, what it looks like to to use stack tools, either the stack, uh, the uh, hitting the rest endpoint directly or using the Python client for stack to make stack queries. But anybody have any questions about our querying APIs? Hopefully some of you are also following along at planetarycomputer.microsoft.com because roughly this talk is kind of organized the way our web page is organized. So hopefully if, feel free to ask questions about things you see on the web page that you don't see in my slides too. I think once. we should do it. I think we should do a hands-on tutorial one day. <laughs> I'll do a short a short demo in a bit uh, that hits a bunch of these things. But definitely, we look forward to. We love doing workshops, and we'd love to have everybody sit down with their laptops, make sure everybody has a planetary computer account, um, and try a bunch of things together. So if we do all those things, now we have not only our super slick pile of files, but a super slick pile of files that's easy to query, which is great, but also still not enough, uh, since even in the example I gave in the last slide. Wyoming is pretty big, uh, and it's going to take you a lot of compute to do whatever it was that you were going to do for Landsat images in Wyoming. But also, we want to make it as easy as possible for whatever analysis you're doing in Wyoming. Presumably, you're working on something important that you'd like to do for the entire world. And we, of course, want to make that as easy as possible. It's going to require a lot of compute cores. Uh, and we'd like you to be able to access a lot of compute cores without having to go get a degree in distributed computing. And that brings us to. Uh, the last core component of our planetary computer environment, which is uh, the what we call the planetary computer hub. This is a Jupyter Lab based uh, computing environment that provides uh, access to our planetary computer data catalog and APIs, uh, and uh, importantly, is connected to a Dask cluster that we are managing uh, to facilitate distributed processing in our environment. And this is where I am going to stop sharing for a second and flip over to a demo. Everybody can feel free. While I'm like awkwardly doing stuff on my screen for a second, everybody can, I can, I can answer questions and move windows around at the same time. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to fire away. Uh, while you're adjusting there, um... How do you prioritize what data gets in there? Great question. I mean, there's some that we didn't have to think too much about to know how important they are to the environmental sustainability community. Like we didn't need to go do a quantitative survey to know that Sentinel-2 and Landsat data are important uh, to the community. Literally everything else is a trade-off that we do 
between what we hear from our users and the sustainability community and the size and cost and complexity of bringing on new data sets. So we really try to be responsive to user feedback. We're really lucky as the F Earth program to have this, our grants program provides us with this great built-in community of 700 plus grantees that represent a broad slice of the sustainability community. So we lean heavily on their feedback, but we email us anytime at AI for Earth data sets at Microsoft.com to tell us your thoughts. Tell us what we're doing right and wrong with the data we're hosting. Tell us the data we're missing. Doesn't mean we're gonna onboard every data set that we hear about from anybody, but we really do take that seriously. Sometimes a single request will do it if it's small and straightforward, uh, but we take every one of those requests into account and accumulate them in a not perfectly quantitative uh, system that helps us prioritize. So we, you know, we're, we're not the experts. We, we lean on the experts in our user community to help prioritize the data that we're missing, including not only the data sets we choose to host, but the decisions we make about uh, how to host that data. For example, how important, great question that came up earlier, how important is the SLC versus GRD data for Sentinel-1? Those are non, we, we don't wanna be making those decisions just by sitting down and talking to each other at Microsoft. We wanna lean on the community to help us make those decisions. Feel free to email us, after at datasets at microsoft.com. Thank you, Dan. There are a couple of questions if you want to take them. Sure, well, uh, fire away. How, how is uh, planetary computer different from GEE? Um, I'll answer this. The second one is easier. Uh, I'll answer really quickly about DAS. <laughs> right. you, will see, you will see a bunch of DASC in a second. So we lean heavily on DASC for the distributed computing, DASC and X-Ray for the distributed computing mm -hmm. portion of our hub. Uh, in uh, the Google Engine question, I think you're right that at a, at a million foot view, if you squint a little, both Earth Engine and the Planetary Computer have a whole lot of data on the cloud connected to um, querying APIs and a scalable compute environment that is free to a point. Uh, so at a thousand foot view, we have a lot in common. Google Earth Engine is also like an amazing tool and we really wanted to make sure that we weren't trying to replicate Google Earth Engine. It's really good at what it does and it wouldn't make sense for us to uh, just build another Google Earth Engine. Um, so you'll see we've made a bunch of uh, decisions that are a little bit different than the approach that Earth Engine has taken. Um, for example, one of the things I'll stress in the demo in a second is that we have our compute environment, a Jupyter lab based compute environment, and it's great if you want to work in that. One of the, there's a trade off here, but we're also, all of the data that we have is just available as tiles on Azure Blob Storage. And if you don't want to use our APIs, you don't want to use our compute environment, you just want to work with all with our data through any number of tools. For example, if you're an Ezra user and you want to work with our data in Ezra tools, that's great. We, you're a planetary computer user too to us. Um, that is a different strategy that limits some of the things we can do. We can't optimize that data for our environment the way Earth Engine has done an amazing job doing. So there's a trade-off there, um, but that's a I slightly know. different approach that we've taken is to really like all the data is just there. And if you want to use our tools, use our tools. I remember you know, like in our interview, you mentioned like you are interested in, in like different roles. Sorry. No. It's okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, hopefully I answered the question about uh, retention. I'll, I'll pick up a couple quick ones here too. Uh, the HLS data, we currently, Remember I mentioned there's a couple of data sets that we host on Azure that are not yet available through our Planetary Computer API. HLS is one of those. Um, it is available on Azure, not almost the full global HLS archive, but not quite, is available on Azure, but not in our Planetary Computer API. We are waiting. So for those of you, I assume whoever asked that question is pretty familiar with HLS. When HLS uh, 1.5 is complete and non-provisional, we, we're kind of waiting for HLS uh, which will be also natively in COG. And so rather than taking our 1.4 archive, doing a bunch of stuff to it, moving it to the Azure region where other data is and indexing in our API, we're gonna let it be in this state for a while. It's great for, we help people work with it on Azure the way it's right now. When HLS 1.5 is complete and ready to go, we will then almost certainly pull that into our planetary computer environment into the Azure region where we host the other data and get it available in our API. Um, and then the second question was, next question was about uh, C-sharp integration. Couple of interesting answers to that one. So uh, you also, so you actually point out something. Um, we have definitely taken a Python first approach right now. I would say we've taken a Python first or second approach. So you, I'm gonna cheat because I've already uh, started my notebook server on the Planetary Computer Hub for this talk. Um, but when you create a, when you log into the Planetary Computer Hub and it asks which image you want to use for your notebook server, there are both Python and R images. We also have a demo 
on our um, uh, on our Planetary Computer web page about working with the Planetary Computer APIs directly from Visual Studio Code, for example. Uh, C Sharp integration will probably look like that. We will encourage you encourage folks to use uh, Visual Studio Code and provide some examples for accessing our uh, querying APIs. But the the honest truth is it'll probably we really want to focus on Python first R second for a little while, and those will continue to be th that represents the substantial the Python and R together represent the substantial majority of our user community, and so those will continue to be the priority languages for a little while. Um, we hope that a vibrant community for other languages develops around Stack in particular, so that we don't necessarily have to do a lot of work to support the use of other languages, but our examples and our bug fixing will focus largely on Python and R for a while. Okay, so let's do, so I'm gonna go click over to our Planetary Computer Hub. Okay, so uh, for those of you who have ever worked in Jupyter Lab, you will recognize that our Planetary Computer Hub is in fact Jupyter Lab. And we think that, um, so hopefully this is a familiar set of tools, the open source tools that you're looking at here. What makes it different than a Jupyter Lab you just started yourself, of course, is that it is connected to the DAF cluster that we're running that I'll demonstrate in a second. Uh, so let's, nope. Mm, let's do this one. Okay, so I'm going to do a quick demo of uh, creating a, anybody, for those of you who do sophisticated remote sensing stuff, you're going to laugh at what I'm about to call a cloudless mosaic. Um, it's a very simple approach to cloudless mosaic creation, but that's not the point of the demo, obviously. Uh, just want to really show you a bunch of the features that I've talked about today all smushed into one demo. Um, it happens to be a cloudless mosaic, but don't take the mosaic part of it too seriously. Um, so uh, I have, before this talk, I logged into the Planetary Computer Hub. It asked me which image I wanted. I just selected kind of the generic Python image for my notebook server. Um, and now I am going to run this cell that creates a DAS cluster. And you can think about this as, I just got a small grant from the AI for Earth program when I created my little DAS cluster. This may take a minute, although it doesn't usually take too long. Um, so I just spun up a, a bunch of, uh, made a bunch of compute cores available for me to do parallel processing uh, on the Planetary Computer Hub. Microsoft is paying for that. We can come back, obviously that puts a limit on how much compute can exist there. We can come back and talk about that later, but I just got a little grant for the AF Earth program to run this uh, DAS cluster. And this is about as much as I'll have to know about DAS in the rest of this notebook and about as much as I'll have to know about uh, distributed computing, and that's something we take really seriously is to uh, try to keep your interaction with the individual nodes as simple as possible so that you don't have to know the ins and outs of DAS or distributed computing to do this kind of work. Uh, now, uh, next thing, I'm going to do a quick demo of kind of our generic, uh, of our uh, spatial temporal querying API. So here is Polygon, somewhere near where I live here in Redmond, Washington. Technically, I live in Bellevue. Close enough. Um, and we're going to use the uh, Python uh, Python tools for Stack to do a query from 2018 to 2020 over our Sentinel-2 data uh, for scenes with a cloud cover less than 25%. We got 107 hits. I'm going to take a little detour uh, from the main cloudless mosaic tutorial to just render one of those tiles using Presteria, using open source tools. The reason I'm taking this little detour is to just highlight that the tiles we got back from API are just, this is a URL to a tile on Azure Blob Storage. If you don't want to work with our hub and you don't want to work with our APIs at all, I mentioned before, this is really important to us that we're able to support the use of uh, just direct access to files through any tools that you like. If you are an Open Data Cube user, if you're an Esri user, we want you to be able to access these files directly, even if you don't use anything else that comes after this in the notebook. Um, so here we go. This is just a regular good old fashioned file. You have all know how to uh, render TIFF images to the screen, and that's what we've done here. Also, this uh, helps me point out that there are, in fact, some clouds here. Um, and there's 
there's a request uh, if you could uh, enlarge your fonts <laughs> if you no can. No problem. Yep, better? Yes. Thanks for reminding me. Um, we got to enlarge the clouds too there. So there's some clouds, it's actually for January in Seattle, this is a particularly not cloudy day, but there are some clouds that we'll hopefully be removing in the Cloudless Mosaic portion of this notebook. Um, but again, the high bit there was like, uh, our API does not hide magic from you. It lets you access files uh, that are also accessible through other tools. So if you don't care about our APIs and our computer environment, you can you can just go start working with the Planetary Computer right now and skip the rest of my talk. But now back to our regularly scheduled DAS demo. Um, I'm gonna do a uh, bad demo form. I'm gonna run a cell and not really talk about it a lot, but this is basically what allows me to connect my Planetary Computer authentication account uh, to allow me to actually access these files since they're, they're not exactly accessible through anonymous access and blob storage. You just have to have a Planetary Computer account to access these uh, URLs. Um, and now I am going to use um, a library called StackStack Stack that lets me create a, a 3D stack of those images we just accessed um, in an X-ray, in a lazily loaded X-ray data set. So what I've just done is without actually reading any data from Diskette, I've uh, created a 107 image by three channel RGB by patch sized uh, data set that I can work with and use for my mosaic creation. I'm gonna tell, uh, I'm gonna tell X-Ray to persist that data in memory. That just kicked off a uh, asynchronous load of the data. That way we won't have to reload the data between the two different composites that I'm about to show you. Um, and now again, without writing a lot of distributed computing code, a lot is gonna happen when I run this line. I, again, I wouldn't recommend this as the most sophisticated way of mosaic creation ever, but it is a nice demo of with a single line of code and this one's gonna take a few minutes. So we'll, we'll go find something to talk about. Um, I have now deferred the operation of computing a median over all the pixels, over all of the scenes in this, uh, in this stack off to my DAS cluster. In fact, we can go back up here. And second, you can see my DAS cluster hard at work. I never even understand what all the bars on these on this uh, DAS monitor tool actually mean, but I am mesmerized every time I look at it. And um, the short version is DAS is hard at work computing that median for us. That is gonna take a couple of minutes, not a lot of minutes, but this is a great time to hit me up with more questions while we're waiting for it to finish. Oh, I think it finished, that was amazing. Oh wait, no, no, it didn't finish. Sorry. There we go, still computing. Uh, so any questions while this is computing? Otherwise, I don't know, we're gonna, we, you can ask me questions about football or guitars or anything because we have about a mm, couple seconds to kill. Um, preferably so, questions though about AI for Earth and the planetary computer. So you mentioned sustainability uh, aspect is, is there uh, are there any like social economic types of data that's already there that people can explore together with uh, earth observation data that's a good question this the majority of our access right now of our archive right now is uh, remote sensing and climate data the closest we have to what I would call socioeconomic data is the high resolution electricity access data set uh, that's derived from a combination. Some of you are probably familiar with that data set uh, that's derived from a combination of the viewers nighttime lights data mm. uh, and global population data. Um, we are uh, onboarding a couple of different gridded population data sets. Um, we are onboarding, this is a complicated long, we could have a whole separate session about this and what this means, but we are also onboarding uh, OpenStreetMap that has, a, in a lot of complicated ways, has what can be utilized as socioeconomic data. Um, but this is not an area that we are deeply familiar with. So this is another area where it's like, we love to hear from users about data that can make uh, the data we should be looking into that we may be missing to support work like that. Because we recognize, we say sustainability, but of course there's a uh, a fine and th there is a blurry line between sustainability and sustainable development. And we uh, we have a very broad view of sustainability and certainly want to support work in that area on the planetary computer. There are a couple of questions in the chat. One is sure. 
Why Dask and not Spark for distributed computing? Um, we we are leaning heavily on Dask in large part because of the really the bricks laid by the Pangeo community, who may, many of you may be familiar with. There may be I'm mean, not looking at the participant list right now, but there may be a bunch of Pangeo folks on this call. Um, the Pangeo community has worked really hard to put together a uh, to make a set of tools play nicely together on the cloud, in particular Jupyter, Dask, and XArray, that really match the kind of workflows that we want to support, and that's why we really really grabbed that whole set of tools wholesale. Uh, and rather than trying to say, well, we like JupyterLab, but we're going to kind of reconfigure the back end to make it work with Spark rather than Dask, we've been pretty happy with what Dask and XRA uh, and JupyterLab allow us to do, like what I'm showing you right now, our computation finished. Um, and that's why we basically, uh, and, and that, of course, that community continues to uh, develop these tools. Um, so we, by really working wholesale with that whole set of tools, we get all the benefit of the work that the Pangeo community has done and the work that the Pangeo community will continue to do. So it's not really a preference. I, I don't even know enough about distributing computing to weigh in on a preference of Dask versus Spark, but I can say that the work the Pangeo community has done with the whole chain of tools really matches the kind of workloads that we want to support. Uh, I'll come back to the notebook for a second because we're gonna have one cell in a second that will also take a minute to run. Uh, not quite as long, but then I'll uh, come back to questions. So our median computation finished. We are going to go and create a true color image of that median and plot it. You can see this area right here is the area where we saw clouds um, in the image we showed above and there are no clouds anymore. So while I won't claim this is a great way to do well, this mosaic creation, mission accomplished. Um, and mission accomplished without having to interact. We just did a lot of computation over a lot of very large Sentinel scenes without having to do, uh, without having to get our hands too deep into the distributed computing side of things. And that's really, I think, exemplary of the type of experience we want to support uh, on the planetary computer. I will kick off one more cell of computation while we talk some more. Um, Let's compute a, let's use the group by tool uh, in X-ray to compute not a mosaic for the whole data set, but a mosaic for each calendar month contained in that data set. Um, so maybe we wanna see a cloud this mosaic that also allows us to watch snow cover change month by month. We kick that off. Uh, that will reuse the data. That will go very quickly because we are not recreating any of the nodes in the DAS cluster and we've also already uh, loaded all of that data into memory and asked XRA to persist it for us. So that finished while I was, while that very long sentence was coming out of my mouth. And now we can plot uh, Claudus mosaics by month. Turns out after further research, it's snowier in January than it is in July. We've made an important scientific discovery. It's more snow in January than in July in Seattle. Uh, but again, uh, that was a pretty powerful computation that just happened without having to get our hands too deep into the distributed computing tools. Uh, I'm stop sharing again. I'll answer a couple more questions and then flip back to slides one more time. Uh, actually, for my sanity, I'm gonna flip back to slides first and then ask, then answer questions. So uh, I can go through the list here. What sure. sort of 3D data is feasible in planetary computer? Uh, it depends what you mean by. Oh, uh, I will. I'm going to. I'm going to make my own decision about how to interpret 3D. Um, obviously, a lot of our data is is multidimensional. Uh, we have climate data that's truly n-dimensional. Obviously, we have a lot of multi-channel and uh, multi-spectral remote sensing data. Um, we are. We have onboarded, but not yet documented. Actually, so a couple of different definitions of what you might mean by 3D. We have uh, a couple of different uh, topographic products that either are available now or in progress. So the NASA DEM digital elevation model is available through our querying API now. We're also onboarding uh, over the next couple of weeks, a couple of alternative global public global DEM products. We have also brought to Azure and not yet publicly uh, documented the full 
USGS US LiDAR point cloud collection. Uh, we're doing a lot of thinking right now. We love input from the community on the right way to have a smooth experience working with LiDAR data in our plant share computer environment. Um, I think we're making some good progress aside from just physically moving the bits. I think we made some good progress on trying to provide a good experience there, both through providing some interesting derived raster products and also uh, working closely with the LiDAR community to provide a good cloud optimized experience for working with those LiDAR point clouds, starting with the USGS data. Um, so those were a couple interpretations of 3D that I had something interesting to say about. Hopefully that was more somewhere close to what the uh, question was getting at when asking about 3D. Okay, the next question is, does planetary computer support uh, deploying of de developed applications, something similar to GEE apps that can be accessed at a URL? We right now don't, um... Actually, I think the best answer is going to be no. Uh, I think part of the so great segue though, because the net the, the last two slides I have are about some of the applications that we work with partners to develop on top of all of this. We are right now not taking an opinionated approach to a single application framework. Like, this is one of the things that we think is uh, is a complicated trade off here in allowing the flexibility of working with our stack API from any environment you want and our um, uh, and our data, which is hosted on a blob storage from any environment you want. But we want people to be able to build applications in whatever frameworks they want. We want to support, again, Esri users building applications in an Esri environment or arbitrary web apps to be able to build on top of our tools. We will significantly expand. Everybody has a different definition of application. We will significantly expand our uh browsing and viewing experiences that you can develop on our data, on derived data, and on your own data over the next few months. That is something that's really important to us. We don't right now have like a really complete browsing experience where you can go and just browse around Sentinel tiles on a map, for example. We do want to get there, both for our data, for derived data that you produce, and for data that you bring. That's not the same as an application, we recognize that, but that's probably for the foreseeable future. That is as far as our opinionated stack will go. We wanna work really hard though to support folks who are building all different types of applications on top of the data from whatever environment they want to be able to access our data and our APIs to, to do that. Uh, next question is, does planetary computer support Stereo imagery process. Um, I'm not sure. I we don't host any data that I would think of as stereo by nature. So maybe if you want to elaborate a little bit on an example of what you'd mean by stereo processing, if you want to elaborate in chat, we can circle back to that question uh, yep. a little bit later. Okay. While while Guru Data uh, comes back with that, uh, let's go to the next question. How much computation performance? will be affected if user is not present in Europe region and is sure. accessing the database from US, for example? Uh, well, there's two levels of accessing from the US. So uh, again, we we really want to encourage folks for a variety of reasons to be doing the computation associated with this data in the West Europe Azure region. Now, of course, that doesn't mean you have to be sitting. I, I'm in Seattle right now, uh, and I have a pretty snappy connection to West Europe, so that's not a problem and really is essentially never a problem that, you know, interactive performance of having my compute located in Europe while my laptop is anywhere else is not a big deal. For very large compute workloads, I mentioned there are, we really want to encourage users, even if you're not working in our planetary computer hub, which is in West Europe. So all the compute, I just, all you, I'm sitting in Seattle and all the compute you just saw me run was in West Europe. That's the experience we want to, give people for the most part, even if you're not using our hub, if you are using any other environment to work with all this data, you're running an application or using Azure Bash or Azure Machine Learning, we want you to set up your computer resources in West Europe. Um, for some scenarios, we may you, we may support some applications setting up their compute resources out, outside of Europe, and you will inevitably pay a penalty in performance um, how much that performance is, how much the penalty is really varies by application. If you're accessing a very small set of scenes, of course, that the network latency is going to be negligible. 
if you were going to do a global analysis, you're going to run your machine learning model on the entire Sentinel-2 or Landsat-8 archive, you would pay a pretty substantial penalty doing that outside of the region where the data is hosted, which is exactly where I want to help you do it in the region where the data is hosted. Okay, um, I wish you let you finish your slide. Sure. Okay, anyway, yes, plus I get to benefit from the segue that somebody set up for me. So I just showed you uh, all of the our, our data, our APIs, and our computing environment that we call our Planetary Computer Hub, and that really is where our Planetary Computer Platform ends right now. But of course, that's still not enough, because now we've given users a great pile of files that's easy to query and the power to compute over that pile of files. But at the end of the day, our real target audience is sustainability decision makers, is just an audience that probably doesn't care about Jupyter or blob storage or stack. Really what we want to support here is the development of uh, scientific analyses and applications that actually support decision making. Uh, which brings us to where the, this is also where the line ends between what we build at Microsoft and what we help partners build. So everything I'm gonna talk about now is just examples of tools that we've helped partners build. Uh, that use the planetary computer in one way or another. Just a couple of examples. Um, I should update this slide with some links, huh? You'll find them all on our webpage. I apologize for not having links here. There are links for these things. Um, that uh, uh, some of the applications, keeping in mind that the planetary computer has only existed for about three months. So there hasn't been a lot of time for an ecosystem of applications to grow up on the planetary computer. But some of the applications that really put the wheels in motion before the planetary computer became public, um, uh, that I think exemplify the kinds of applications we want to support, all using very different tools. And again, this is also gets back to the answer of, you know, we're not too prescriptive right now, for better or for worse. We're not too prescriptive about a specific application framework. We want to support all different flavors of applications. So we've worked with uh, Development Seed to build a, uh, a tool for accelerating land use and land cover assessment uh, with AI using planetary computer data. Uh, we've worked with uh, Visuality and the Nature Conservancy on uh, an application for conservation spatial planning and with Carbon Plan on a analysis for prioritizing carbon offset projects and an associated visualization application. It's kind of hit the space of like some really different types of applications some really different concepts of what an application even is, some really different areas of sustainability, but I think kind of draw a nice envelope on the kind of applications we want to support Basically what our North Star is, why we're doing all of this is to support applications like these that accelerate conservation workflows and conservation decision-making. And that is the end of my talk and we can flip entirely over to questions now. Um, you, uh, I think there are just a couple of questions and then we'll wrap up. Uh, is there a list of functions or algorithms that can be performed using planetary computer? Does planetary computer support, for example, deep learning or frequency domain-based functions like Fourier transform? Um, so, so give me one second. Um, so we um, we have some examples on our uh, planetary computer webpage. We have um, one deep learning example right now. But as of right now, we don't have a lot of higher level. So remember, I, when I talked about our, I had a slide called API. I talked about our core spatial temporal querying API, which is the really the most important API to us right now that we support right now. And then I had a much more hypothetical line about, and we want to support in a more opinionated way, canonical raster processing operations, for example, uh, over the next few months. That's kind of where we're at right now is we don't have, um, we lean heavily on the open source Python ecosystem for doing a lot of these things. And as many of you know, there are great tools for doing all the things you just described using the same tools that we uh, provide access to on our Planetary Computer Hub using, um, and that we use in all of our examples. But we do not yet have an opinionated stance on those higher level uh, operations. We are definitely gonna get there. So that is an area where we do wanna provide some opinionated examples uh, and some tools, particularly for making sure that you don't have to reinvent the wheel for using Dask to do uh, parallel to parallelize that kind of computation. So we will be adding a number of tools over the next few months that make uh, both deep learning and some core raster operations um, like blending and reprojection uh, more straightforward. But right now we just lean heavily, we have a bunch of examples that lean heavily on the open source Python ecosystem to do those things. 
Thank you, Dan. Uh, there's one question about does it support uh, LIDAR processing? We currently have neither LIDAR processing tools nor any LIDAR data available on the planetary computer, but that will certainly change over the next couple of months. I mentioned that we have brought to Azure and just not quite yet finished publicly documenting the USGS LIDAR point cloud collection. And so really trying to grow our, um, our the set of tools and data that we support uh, around LIDAR processing. I would say not yet, but getting there. So we are right on time. Uh, I think uh, this was a very good discussion. Thank you all the audience for engaging in, uh, in this discussion and interrupting Dan. Um, and Dan, uh, thanks from the GRSS community. I think this was very helpful. And uh, hopefully we can do a deeper dive and hands-on tutorial at some point in the near future. Definitely, and if you have questions, please uh, hit me up. I'm Dan at Microsoft.com or Planet Tech Computer at Microsoft.com. Basically, if you guess, you'll find us. Yeah, it's very easy to remember Dan's email, dan at microsoft.com. So hit him with Thanks, emails. everyone. <laughs> Thank you.